guys so much for being here. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to be here with you guys. Give it up again for my little brothers who did worship today. Man, that was just um, so incredible, and uh, I want you guys to know that it is the privilege uh, of my lifetime to week in and week out be here and to lead uh, this incredible body of people in worship, and uh, I love you guys so much, and I'm so thankful for every single one of you, and there isn't a place I would rather be on a Sunday morning than with my Zion family, and so I want to ask you guys to help me create an atmosphere uh, this morning and every morning that we come and gather. I know that sometimes you guys are tired. I know sometimes you haven't had your coffee, and I know sometimes it's a little bit more serious than that, and there's stuff going on, uh, but let's do something. Let's change the atmosphere in this place. It's going to take every single person to engage and to be paying attention and to just be a little bit focused and excited, and so I want to teach you guys, if someone tells a joke, after they tell the joke, it is polite to laugh. Even, after, even if the joke you don't think is funny, but that's kind of how crowds and things work. And if you go, if, imagine if you walked into a comedy club or you're seeing your favorite comic and he's telling jokes and no one is laughing. You do not want to be in that atmosphere. There is tension, there is stuff going on. Or imagine you go to a wedding and nobody is crying and nobody is excited. Or imagine you're going to a funeral and nobody is, also nobody is crying, right? The atmosphere in the room um, can be very inviting and welcoming and exciting or whatever the case might be. And we want the house of God to have an atmosphere of faith. Uh, we want to, so right there is where you should have gotten a little bit of excited. There you go, yeah. So you guys are learning a little bit. So when we worship, that's the time to get excited about the things of God and give God the glory that he's due. And we raise our hands and we clap and we dance and we do whatever it is that you feel comfortable with. Now, I know some of you guys are introverts. And some of you guys are like sweating at the thought of all the things that I just said. And so if that is you, you're slightly dismissed. But the rest of us, guys, let's be excited. Let's enter in and let's have an atmosphere of faith here in this place. Uh, there's a story of a pastor who was taking over a church. Um, the senior pastor was stepping down, uh, the original pastor, and this new pastor was coming in. And he was trying to get to know some of the families and the people there at the church and so this couple invited him over for lunch, and he went over, and uh, they asked him a bunch of theological questions and different things, and they were trying to just get to know him a little bit. And uh, he noticed that they had um, some fancy silverware, some like, you know, uh, I don't know what you call that, China or something. Anyway, and he noticed that, and he just kept a mental note of that, and so he was like, thank you so much for having lunch, and uh, he left. Well, as the months go by, the wife of that family was like, one of my spoons is missing that my grandma gave me. <laughs> Ever since that pastor came over, I think he took it. And so the husband was like, no, why would he do that? We invited him over for lunch. He's a man of God. He would not steal your, you know, china or whatever. Yeah, I don't even know what it's called, so someone help me after service. But, um, and so as the months go by, I mean, the bitterness and the rage just grew, and she just could not believe that he was not, you know, going to own up to this. And so, one Sunday, they, the couple prayed about it, and they went up to the pastor, and she says, Pastor, I want you to know, we know what you did. We know that you took my grandmother's spoon, and uh, we were leaving the church. We we're no longer going to be able to be a part of this body. And he says, oh, I didn't take it. I put it in your Bible. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so that's not a true story that I'm aware of, but that is a good story. <laughs> so here we go. There we are. We're changing the atmosphere here a little bit. You guys are loosening up. Thank you guys so much for being here. So I want to take some time before I jump into our teaching text and stuff, and just to speak of blessing over our people and our church. Uh, around four years ago, I believe that God gave me a vision of where we are right now. Uh, it was, I did not know what the year was, circa 20-something. And so we're there, and Andrew is teaching these middle school students or high school students, and um, I'm sitting there observing his teaching and stuff, and I had just gotten done leading worship, and all of a sudden I felt like I was transported into the future, and I could see Andrew leading a body of people, but it wasn't teenagers, it wasn't the room that we were in, but I felt like God was giving me a vision of Andrew being the pastor of a church. And uh, if you know me, I grew up in a very strict Baptist uh, upbringing. We do not believe in visions, right? God does not do anything like that. And so my Baptist mind was a little bit rattled. And I was like, what just happened? And I was like, I know that I, you know, don't do drugs or anything like that. And so this is a little bit crazy. 
And so I really couldn't shake the feeling at all. And so uh, after the message and everything, uh, me and Andrew were hanging out, and I pulled him into his office, and I said, hey, man, I really don't know how to say this. I've never said these kind of words before, but I think God gave me a vision. And then he's all, well, please share. What happened? And so I tell him what I felt like God showed me. And he got spooked, and he said, me and my wife believe that God wants us to start a church. And we've been waiting for confirmation that God would use somebody to tell us. And here it is. And so, yeah, yeah, give it up for the Lord. And so I am living and experiencing in these days things that I believe God showed me back then. And whether you know it or not, you are fulfilling God's promises in my life every week by just showing up on a Sunday morning. And so thank you guys for being here. Um, Whether God has brought you today or God brought you years ago, uh, I am so happy that you guys are here. Each one of you is a walking testimony to the goodness and the faithfulness uh, of our God. And I've never been in a church community like this before. Uh, I am being completely honest with you. Um, There's been so many times where uh, family and friends and different people have come, and they have just been so blessed by every single one of you guys just loving on them and reaching out to them. And so I thank you guys for that. Uh, Granted, I am not very old, so I haven't seen too much, uh, but I really believe that God has done something very unique and special in this body. And it is my sincere belief that God has called this group of people for such a time as this. And I think one of the things that God wants to do specifically through Zion City Church is raise up a generation of Jesus followers that are more concerned about being with God than doing things for God. A people that put presence over practice. Presence over practice. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that practice is good, right? Week after week, we gather so that we can be recalibrated, rejuvenated, and encouraged to practice our faith in a world that has no love for the things of God. But more important than the work that God wants to do through you and me is the work that God wants to do in you by the work of His Holy Spirit in relationship with Him. Everything that we do in service to God flows from our being with God. Scripture says that every good and perfect gift comes from our Father above. Every good thing. Um, There's a story, uh, a pastor that I really love and admire, Francis Chan, was telling a story of how every time he goes to a speaking event or he's at uh, a conference or does something, that he has people that come up to him afterwards and are like, Pastor, thank you so much you know, for your ministry on Facebook or, you know, what you post on Instagram or your tweets. It just saved my life and God just really used it. And he he says, every time I tell them, I am so glad that God is doing that for you. But that is not me. I do not have a Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. (laughs) And so he said, I don't know why, but these people have an obsession of making fake accounts and pretending to be me and then trying to help people for God. And he says, I'm slightly flattered and slightly concerned. And he says, and so he says, my staff and I, he says, we try and shut down these accounts uh, just because it's not me. It's not me, the one, I'm not the one running it. I'm not saying these things and they're putting words in my mouth. And after a while, my, uh, he says, my secretary said, do you really want to shut down every single account? Some of them are saying some pretty good stuff. And they actually are quoting you. And uh, he says, yeah, but I'm not the one who's behind it. And then he made the parallel and he said, how many times do we have conferences? Do we have services? Do we do things? And we're quoting God and we have the book, right? We've got the theology and we're doing all the stuff, but God is not the one who started and initiated that thing. I was under extreme conviction, and this is one of the things that kind of inspired today's message and what I hope to talk to you guys about. My notes are incredibly scrambled. I was up till 3 a.m., and I was up at 7, and I'm (laughs) extremely tired, but I believe that God has something specific for each one of you guys. So bear with me as we go through this. But guys, I believe that the presence of God and that God moving in each one of our hearts and lives individually is the most important thing that we can do. There is no point in coming to gather corporately and do all this stuff for some sort of agenda if God is not the one that you are seeking. 
Now, I believe that God can use all kinds of different things. God can use a song. God can use a message. God can use all these different things. And so if you come to church and you're not seeking the presence of God, I'm not telling you not to come. Please come back. Uh, Please be with us. We would love to have you anytime. But guys, the reason I believe that God started this church, I believe that God planted that seed in our pastor's heart and that he put that vision in, in my heart. And I believe he did that for a lot of you. There are people that are here in this place that ended up here because they, you know, were leaving somewhere else or whatever was happening in their path weaved and landed them here, and they believe that God led them here. And guys, I'm here to say that we have to follow the Spirit's leading. Every single week and every single month, me and Andrew were talking about the things that are going on in this church, and we have no idea if God is going to allow this church to stay open for five years or five months. It is all faith. We do not have a gigantic savings account with a time span of how long we can do this thing. It is all, we are just, we are going as long as God continues to lead us. And we hope that we stay there, that we stay at Jesus' feet, and that we continue to listen to his voice, and that we follow his directing because we don't want it to be us quoting God. We want him to be the one behind it. And so I hope that you guys have that same heart. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, you can use your phone, use the Bible app, and go to Luke chapter 10. Uh, Does anyone need or would like a physical Bible? If they do, we have some in the back, and I can have someone grab one for you. You guys okay? You guys are shy? All right. There we go, a little bit of laughter. So, you guys, you got to warm up. You got to loosen up. You got to be, all right, everyone do 10 head rolls. Do this. Do the head rolls. I only see like five of you doing it. All right, there you go. Now slap your neighbor. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Please don't do that. We do not promote violence here at Zion City Church. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. I will be reading out of the English Standard Version. Sorry, Drew. I know you love the NIV, but uh, I don't have a physical version yet, so get there. Pray for me. Christmas present. All right. Luke chapter 10. Uh, We're going to be in verses uh, 38 through the end of the chapter. So this is a story... Um, that sets up kind of where we're going to be in our teaching text, and it kind of gives us a precursor to where uh, we'll be at in John 12 later on. So put a placeholder in John 12. Let's read Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Let me say right there, it's a good idea to welcome Jesus into your house if you haven't yet. And she had a sister, verse 39, called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So Jesus is invited into Martha and Mary's house, and they also have a brother named Lazarus. And the, gospel, the Gospels are full of stories of Jesus eating meals with people. Uh, there was one theologian that said, in the Gospels, Jesus is either on his way to a meal, eating a meal, or leaving a meal that he just ate. And I want to be more like Jesus in that way. Can I get a witness this morning? And uh, at this dinner, we see that these two sisters are in two different rooms, and they have two different postures. Martha is most likely in the kitchen preparing uh, a meal for Jesus and his disciples, and Mary is most likely on the living room floor sitting right next to Jesus' chair as he's teaching. And the text says that Martha was distracted with much serving, but Mary was at the feet of Jesus. And Martha actually gets upset by this, as any sister would, if she was not helping. She asks Jesus to tell Mary to get up and help her. And I want you to imagine the confidence and the nerve that you have to have to tell God to help your sister do the chores, right? So uh, it's just she had no fear there, and she just went right to the Lord and said, hey, will you tell my sister to get off her butt and to help me feed you guys? I know none of us have a problem telling God what to do, another sermon for another time, but up to this point, In Martha's defense a little bit, it really doesn't seem like she's being that harsh. Practically speaking, they need to eat, right? Uh, And someone is going to have to make the food. (laughs) And serving a large amount of guests would be much easier with several people doing the job than just one person. So if your mom is in the kitchen alone on Thanksgiving, this is your invitation now to get up and go help her. Don't make her do it all by herself. 
But listen to how Jesus responds. I'm going to read verse 41. And in the New Living Translation, he says, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. But there is only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Mary had discovered in that moment that when Jesus is in the room, nothing else matters. Mary was in the presence of God, and all was well. She was at peace. Everything had fallen to the wayside, and she could see God. In the Psalms, it says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Paul says in Philippians 3, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, my Lord. For his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. See, the posture of these two sisters was Martha was doing a good thing. She was serving Jesus. I am at, at all, I'm not trying at all to discourage you from serving Jesus. I'm thankful for those of you that come and you filled out the servant's application and gone through the interview and you come early and you set up and you do all that stuff. All of that stuff is amazing, but that is not a substitute for knowing and being with Jesus himself. Uh, I feel like in my life, uh, I'll just speak for myself, I had it backwards for so long. I wanted to know God, and so I felt like I had to do things for Him. Let me tell you now, church, you do not have to do anything for God. God has done everything for you. He wants you. He wants you to be in the room. He wants to hear you. He wants to see you, and He wants you to hear and see Him. We have to put His presence over the practice of the things that we do. And sometimes it's easy to get those things, you know, out of alignment. I understand, but we always have to come back to the feet of Jesus and just be obsessed with Him. I get nervous every single time that I teach, not because I'm afraid of public speaking. Thankfully, I don't really mind that too much. But just because I feel like, God, I feel like I have nothing of value to say. I feel like sometimes I don't understand your book. And we have an amazing pastor (laughs) who teaches so well. And I feel like it's such a hard thing to follow that up. Uh, and teach after him, and so I hope that you guys aren't too disappointed <laughs> this morning. But, um, but I think anytime there's a speaker present, and they're giving the Word of God, and they're speaking to God's people, or they're speaking on behalf of God, I think the most important thing is that they should be able to point to that person and say, I don't know necessarily what he's talking about, but that person seems like he knows God. It seems like the things that he's saying that God has told him and that there's something that he has that I don't have and that it doesn't come from studying and it doesn't come from practice of talking and doing all this stuff, but it comes from being in the presence of Jesus and it comes from knowing him and craving him and him alone. And honestly, guys, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. You know, sometimes I do. But for most of the time, For any of you guys that know me, I am tired. I have a one-year-old daughter, and she does not sleep very well. Uh, And sometimes I get stressed. I'm a manager at a restaurant here in town, and uh, God bless all you guys that come, you know, to our restaurant and you eat. And uh, but I mean, it gets stressful over there. I mean, we have meme pages of stuff that goes on over there at work just because it's a whole different thing. But uh, I mean, I want our church and us to be people marked by the presence of God, that wherever you and I go, when people encounter us, they encounter the real and living God. Does it happen that when you go places, you're judgmental and you're harsh, thinking that you're better than other people? Because that is not what God is like. Does it happen that when you go places, you find yourself lacking courage and lacking faith, And, you know, just feeling like you have no power because that is not what God is like. Do you find yourself just wondering what in the world is going on? I do too. (laughs) But guys, we have to sit at the feet of Jesus. We have to sit at his feet. And we were talking about atmosphere earlier. The atmosphere that changes when we worship and when we engage and we ask God to come and be in our midst we, were, we sing a song sometimes called Inhabit, and it talks about uh, uh, that God inhabits the praises of his people, and that comes from the Old Testament, that there's this idea that when we sing and we give God the glory and the worship that he is due, that something literally changes 
and that God touches down and he moves and he speaks and he heals and he does things. And I, guys, I believe that. Um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been listening to a ton of messages, just trying to get inspiration for today. And uh, I was listening to this one pastor. Uh, he teaches, I won't tell you what church because you'll look it up and you'll find whatever. But uh, so I'm listening to, he's one of my favorite uh, speakers. I like him because he's different than me and because I don't agree with everything that he says. And uh, if you don't have a habit of interacting with people that don't agree with you all the time, start doing that. Uh, start kind of like rounding off the hard edges of yourself. If you're just in an echo chamber of people that think like you, believe like you, like the things you like, that is not healthy. We all need to grow as people. And so uh, I've been listening to this um, guy and his messages, and he was talking about these miracles that have been happening in their church. And he starts talking about all these stories of healings, um, you know, uh, cancer being taken away and the doctors having no explanation, um, people that have had chronic illness and pain coming forward and um, being healed. And I mean, just weeping and, you know, not recognizing what's happening. Unbelievers coming into the house with, you know, uh, hurts and ailments and coming in and hearing the Word of God and being healed without anyone laying hands on them, without praying for them. And I heard this message, and my very first feeling was, what? Is that real? I'm like, I don't even know if that's true. I feel like maybe he's making this up, right? That's my, that's my very first feeling. I believe the scriptures, I believe these miracles here, right? I believe that Jesus did these things, but some, for some reason, when this guy was telling these stories, I had a hard time believing it. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty of reasons for that. There's people that, you know, are wolves in sheep's clothing that have told lies and have, you know, um, made a mockery of God and of the scriptures and things and take advantage of people, and there's things like that uh, for sure. But I do believe that God still does miracles. I do believe that God still does heal and that he speaks and those kinds of things. And so I was really struggling with this. And I was actually talking with Tim one day after service and was just kind of sharing with him. I was like, I was like dude, this is, this is weird. I was like, I don't want to have this feeling. I don't want to have this immediate feeling of like, I don't know. I, don't, I feel like that didn't happen. But immediately I thought, and I was talking to my wife, I was like, you know what would be great to do? We got to go out there. Let's go to their church sometime. Let's take a weekend off and let's just go and experience and just see what's happening. Now, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but God is not stuck in California, <laughs> right? God does things all over the place, but immediately I felt like I needed to go there to be what God was doing. We were talking about atmosphere. That church has an atmosphere of expectation that God is going to do the miraculous and the mighty. And immediately I felt like I needed to go to that place to see God work. In Matthew 13, verse 58, it talks about Jesus leaving a town, and it says that he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Guys, what kind of atmosphere are we setting with our faith in this place? And it starts with me. I'm not necessarily trying to point fingers at you. I'm, I'm speaking from my own, my own lack of faith and my own doubt. If we have an atmosphere of expectation that God is going to do the miraculous, that God wants to heal and not just heal physically, that God wants to heal broken hearts. God wants to heal those that have, uh, you know, mental challenges and mental illness and things like that. God wants to help those that are, you know, suffering from uh, depression and all these different things. And so, guys, we've got to have an atmosphere of faith. Um, shortly after that, I was just, you know, praying after feeling those feelings of just like, God, I would love to see you move. I'd love to see you do something. And so it's a Monday night, I'm at work, and uh, we're getting ready to close, and I'm counting the registers, and I'm sitting in the office at Dion's, and as I'm counting the change, I feel God's presence in the office at work. And so guys, I want to tell you, this is another thing where I've, I've never had a vision since that one time. It was a one-time experience. Um, I hope that God does something like that again. And also, as I was there in the office, I've never, ever, ever in my life that I remember felt like, oh man, this is God's presence. But this happened to me. I'm, I'm literally counting money. I'm not doing anything spiritual. <laughs> I'm there and I'm counting money and I feel God's presence. And I just like am overwhelmed. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, <laughs> is this you? And God starts to speak these things over me. He's like, son, I love you. 
son, I've been there, son, and he just starts, and I'm, so I'm, I'm getting emotional, I'm sitting there in the office, and I immediately, I'm like, Lord, why don't you do this at church? I'm here at work, <laughs> and then the Lord rebuked me, and I was like, oh, yes, all right, so I, I'm here, I'm here still, I'm listening, and so I just sit there, and I stop counting the money, and I just allow God to speak, and I'm sitting there, and one of my employees comes in, and he's like, hey, am I good to clock out, and I was like, yeah, go ahead, and he clocks out, and, uh, and then he kind of lingers and says, yesterday at church was pretty good. And God tells me, listen to him. And so I was like, oh, snap. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, oh, yeah, what was good about church? And he just starts to tell me about how God was speaking directly to him through the message and that he's never felt anything like that before. And uh, he was very honest. He says, honestly, sometimes I'm a little bored when I come to church. He says, but God keeps bringing me back, and I don't know why. And I felt God, you know, like through this message, speak directly to me, and I've never felt anything like that. And so we just begin to talk, and he begins to share the things that, you know, is going on in his life, and, and we're just sharing. We're just going back and forth. And then he asked me, do you feel that? Does it feel weird in here? And I was like, I'm not the only one. And so I was like, I was like, yes. So I was like, and so I tell him, I was like, right before you came in here, I was counting the money, and I felt like God's presence came here into the office. And he's like, this is weird. And I was like, I know. I was like, this is crazy. And I was like, I believe this is just the beginning, though, of what God wants to do. And he's like, what's next? <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. And I was like, I don't, and, and so, and the things he was saying um, was just amazing to hear that, what God was doing in his heart and his life at that exact moment. And so I was telling him, I was like, bro, don't forget these moments. Hold on to this. And remember, because there are going to be moments when you walk through valleys and you're going to wonder and you're going to, you know, all this stuff is going to happen. So I said, hold on to this. And when God is speaking, just have your ears open and your hands open. And, uh, and so <laughs> I said, dude, I feel like I weigh five pounds. Like if I jumped up in the air, I would float. And then he was like, imagine if anyone heard this conversation right now. They would think we were stoned. And so <laughs> I was like, I know, man, this is just insane. And so... Um, he left. Uh, he said, I'm going to hang out for a little bit. And I was like, okay. And so I, uh, I was like, well, I should probably get back to work. I am on the clock. So <laughs> I, uh, I get up and I go to get a drink of water because my mouth is parched from talking and just different things. And uh, I don't know how to explain it other than just like that. I felt God's presence lift. And I immediately was just so sad. Um, I was just like, ah, for a, a split moment, about five minutes, I didn't have a question. I didn't, I didn't have any worry. I, was, uh, I, I didn't know everything, but I knew that everything was fine. And, and God was there, and nothing else mattered. But then I, f I felt it lift, and I was like, oh, <laughs> so, where are you going? And uh, I, at the time, I was also reading the Narnia, uh, one of the Narnia books, uh, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. And at the end, if you guys have read the book or seen the movie, when Aslan leaves, the kids get all sad. And the beaver, Mr. Beaver, tells them, he says, don't be sad. He comes and he goes, but he's always around. And, uh, and that's how I felt, man. I was just like, I was like, oh, God. I was like, you got to do that again. Like, and you got to start doing that for other people. Um, and I realized in that moment uh, that I was like, that's what God wants to do for every single individual. He wants to bring them close. He wants to give them peace that passes understanding. He wants to answer their questions or silence their questions. He wants to let them know who they are in him and who he is to them. And uh, it was just incredible. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 12, and we're going to jump into our teaching text. John is just a few pages away or scrolls away from uh, Luke chapter 10. John chapter 12. So setting this up a little bit, um, not too long ago, Andrew talked about the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. How many of you guys remember that story, Andrew, talking about that story? A few of you, or you might have heard that story before, but uh, Lazarus is Martha and Mary's brother, and he died. And he died because Jesus didn't get to him in time. They were asking him, hey, he is sick, can you please come and heal him? And Jesus was just uh, caught up with just all these people and different things, and, uh, and he was late, and Lazarus ended up dying. When Jesus gets there, late, raises Lazarus from the dead, and it's just a spectacle. Um, and, you know, what's crazy, this is not in my notes at all, but I'm just thinking about this, that it says that some people there didn't believe. And I, I think about that, and I'm like, how can you see a dead person come back to life and not believe? That is some serious 
doubt. And uh, so my prayer is that uh, whatever God does today or starting today and in the future that God does in your life, that you would not doubt what God is doing. Um, But so Lazarus is raised from the dead. And uh, this is sometime later that Jesus is in their home, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And this is where the story picks up. So John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So there's so much here. And I I really had a lot of rabbit trails of things that I wanted to talk about, but I'm just going to mention a few things. So notice that Martha is still serving, but she's not complaining. She's no longer worried about what her sister is or isn't doing. Let me help you out this morning. If you are focused, more focused, on what other children of God are or are not doing, other than being with Jesus, you have missed the point. And at this point, it seems like Martha has, uh, has been changed by the presence of God herself and by the words of Jesus herself, and she's still serving. And there's this three-tier, there's this image here, there's Martha that is serving, there's Lazarus that is sitting and is fellowshipping, and then there's Mary that's sitting and worshiping. Lazarus is eating with Jesus. I think that is so cool. Uh, there must have been people there at the dinner that were just there to see the dead guy eat <laughs> and to see what was going on. Um, other stuff that I don't have time to get into, if you read the rest of the chapter, it says that some uh, people were there for that reason, that they were there, they wanted to see what the heck was going on with Lazarus, and they wanted to put him to death because they didn't like the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Pretty crazy. So uh, I want to focus in on one area from this text. When Mary encounters the presence of God for a second time, it leads her to worship. Two things will happen when someone experiences the supernatural presence of God. One, you'll be overcome with fear because sitting in His holiness and being aware of our sin is such a frightening thing. The Scripture says that it is a a frightening thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that is because we are sinners and we are broken. And so that can have a tendency to happen when you encounter God. You begin to feel fear. But then the second thing is that there's there's joy and peace and comfort because God is good and because he is just. And that leads to worship. So Mary comes to Jesus and in a moment of wild and passionate worship to her Savior, she pours out this perfume on the Lord Jesus Now think about this. She didn't just give him a couple sprays of the perfume. She poured out the whole bottle. So Jesus was probably literally dripping because she didn't hold anything back. And the fragrance from that offering that she gave filled the entire house. I want to say a few things about worship. Pure worship is going to cost you something. In 2 Samuel 24, 24, David says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. I think so many times, I myself, I give God something that cost me nothing. I, I, I work in area of margin, things that I'm able to do, uh, and God is growing me in this area. Later in our text, it says that this perfume cost 300 denarii, which is about a year's wages. So for, you know, some of us, let's say about around $30,000 worth. That's an expensive bottle of perfume is all I have got to say. We, who knows how long Mary had saved up to buy this gift, or maybe she inherited it, or I have no idea what the circumstances are there. But uh, in Jesus' day, it was custom for guests to be anointed when welcomed into the home. When your guest came over, you would anoint them with oil or with a perfume, and you would welcome them, and you would wash their feet, and you would bring them in to the house. Maybe Mary would use this uh, perfume from time to time to anoint the guests that would come over, you know, using just a small drop or just a little bit, hoping that it would last her lifetime. But when Jesus came into the house, she couldn't help herself. That was all that she had. 
And it was, it was the most that she had. And she wanted him to know how much he meant to her. And she pours out the whole thing. Pure worship is going to cost you something. Not because God requires it, but because it's what he is worth. My wife doesn't have to ask me to spend money on her. I want to. <laughs> right? I want to do things for her. True love is expressed through pure motives. When you have a good relationship with somebody and you care about them, you're prone to do things that are probably not wise because you just care about them and you love them so much. And so you pour it all out. You go all out. You go into debt and you do these things because you just love that person. Don't go into debt for the Lord here this morning. Uh, let's be wise with our money. Um, but true love is expressed through pure motives. But also, pure worship will make others uncomfortable. Uh, let's pick back up in verse 4. John 12, verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. See, Judas did not think that Jesus was worth the gift that Mary gave. He would rather it be given to the poor, or so he said. Judas, actually, we get an inside scoop here that he did not actually care about the less fortunate. He wasn't doing anything for the homeless. Uh, this text gives us an inside look that Judas was actually stealing the money that people donated and gave. He wasn't actually upset that people's needs weren't being met, but he was uncomfortable by the overwhelming display of love and affection that Mary poured out on Jesus. I imagine that everybody in the room was made uncomfortable. While anointing a house guest was custom then, uh, women were not to touch men uh, unless there was you know, some sort of marital, close relationship, and it was in private. The act of her anointing Jesus' feet with her hair would have been seen as deeply disturbing and inappropriate and wrong. So everyone in the room was probably made extremely uncomfortable. But Jesus wasn't. Jesus accepted this. If God is asking you to do something that makes other people feel uncomfortable, but you know in your heart of hearts that you've got to do that thing, it doesn't matter what anybody else is telling you or what anybody else is saying, you listen to the voice of God and you listen to the Holy Spirit within you. Now, if that is going against Scripture or something, then check again, that is not the voice of God. But my friends, pure worship makes people uncomfortable. When you do something for the Lord that is generous and outrageous, people are going to, one, they're going to compare themselves to you and think, well, I would not do that, so that's weird that they're doing it. And then secondly, they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. It's weird. But God wants to welcome you in there. He wants all of you. He wants you to enter in. Another thing I notice is that pure worship moves the heart of God. In a parallel passage in Mark 14, Jesus says this about this encounter. He says, I promise you that as this wonderful gospel spreads all over the world, the story of her lavish devotion to me will be mentioned in memory of her. Out of all the things that happened in Jesus' time, this is the moment that Jesus says will spread like wildfire in the world along with the gospel. This moment? Really, when that lady made everyone feel uncomfortable by letting her hair down and wiping Jesus' feet? Yes, that moment. And guys, this is why I believe that God's presence is so important. When we enter in and we experience God and God moves and He begins to change us, He wants to have an impact in our lives and in the world around us. He wants to use you. But more than that, He wants to be with you. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up now. And if you guys could hit some of the lights on your way back up. I want us to just spend a moment recognizing 
that God is here. God is here now in this place. Every care and every worry and every struggle and everything that you're carrying, He is aware of. And I can't give you answers to every single question that you have. But I can tell you my experience. My experience is is that I have been in the presence of Jesus. And I do not want to leave And I want that for every single one of you. I want every single one of you guys to be changed by the presence of God. I know some of us are zoned in right now. We hear, you guys are hearing what God is saying. You're tuned in. Just to give you guys some practical things, it's not always going to be magical, touchy-feely, you know, amazing story. Sometimes it's going to be something very natural. And you're going to think, wow, that was actually really cool or that was actually good. Guys, recognize that. Learn to hear God's voice. Learn to sense the Spirit moving. When you feel a moment of relief, you feel a moment of peace and you have these moments of clarity, that's God. He's by you. He's near you. Whenever that, uh, you know, that doubt or that thought or whatever it is that rises up that you can't seem to put away that comes back over and over and then it it seems to fade away for just a moment that is God and he's trying to speak and he's trying to move in moments when you've been just you know tired and you get a little bit more sleep that's the Lord there's so many things that God does that just seems so natural and it's easy to miss But guys, I want us to learn to be people of God's presence. Let's encourage one another. Let's lift each other up and let's tell each other about these things that God is doing. When you finally get an answer to that question, share that. When you finally get an answer to that prayer, share that. I believe God wants to do so much more. Let's fill this church and let's fill this city with faith so that God will come and touch down and do the miraculous and do the mighty. Let's change the atmosphere of the room that we're in by singing and shouting songs of praise and by declaring our love for God, even in the midst of doubt and even in the midst of all that stuff. You guys, you can't live by those those, uh, feelings and uh, frustrations that you have. If you let those things guide you, you're going to be all a mess. Imagine if you just followed every single feeling that told you to sleep in. You would never go to work. You would never get things done. We've got to learn to listen to the voice of God and to follow that even when we can't hear it, even when it seems silent, even when it seems like we have no faith, we have to believe what is true and we have to believe that God is good and we have to chase after that one thing. God, I pray that this morning you would give your people, Lord, just an overwhelming sense of your goodness.